as Alvin mentioned, I am a program manager here at the mine. So I have been um, managing several autism research studies here um, for a little over six years. Um, and so in joining LEND, I really wanted to have a project that kind of tied into improving the research that we're already doing here at the MIND. Um, so I'll be presenting work engaging researchers in breaking down barriers to inclusivity in research. This is my quick disclaimer slide, just to say that the information presented here is um, my own opinions and findings and the opinions of those who participated in this research. Um, and before I start, I just wanna make a quick brief note on language. Um, that I'll be using. So I'm cognizant that there are often really strong preferences for one form or another. Um, and I respect the preferences of everyone watching may not be the same. Um, but throughout this presentation, I will be using those both person first and identity first language interchangeably. Um, this research also focuses on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So the acronym IDD will show up throughout. Um, and I also use the terms disability and disabled um, in following disability self-advocate preference for using these terms rather than other euphemisms. So to begin, um, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, tend to have less access to healthcare services and the access that they do have tends to be of a lower quality. And then these inequities are compounded by other existing disparities um, in healthcare. So things like race and ethnicity or income and poverty level. <clears throat> and so we really need research that's going to help us improve services and access. But in order to have meaningful outcomes, research really needs to incorporate the needs of the impacted communities. Um, but partnerships between researchers and the community have historically not been inclusive or accessible, um, and they're resulting in poor representation of the needs of racially and ethnically diverse communities, um, non-English speaking, lower income, um, as well as intellectually and developmentally disabled individuals and their families. So if we can identify what the barriers are that are preventing this engagement between communities and researchers, the first step to helping us improve research programs and have more meaningful and impactful um, outcomes from our research. So there's this clear gap between researchers and the community, and there's a need to build trust and meaningful equitable partnerships between them. So to do that, um, we really need um, to kind of understand what is the existing knowledge, what do researchers know about community needs and healthcare disparities. Um, we need to identify what the barriers are to creating those partnerships with diverse uh, populations, as well as create recommendations for researchers um, on how to improve their research programs. So um, for this project, I ran focus groups with the mind, with various mind research faculty. Um, and the groups were asked questions with, to prompt discussion around barriers to conducting research with people with IDD and their families, as well as barriers to those community partnerships. Um, and then coded their responses for themes, as well as topics that were identified as either challenges or areas of past success. Um, in addition to the groups I'm going to talk about today, this is part of a larger uh, project that is also conducting focus groups with self-advocates, parents and family members, and community providers. Uh, this is my quick demographic slide. Um, the diversity of who participated in this is limited by uh, who actually becomes research faculty. So this is um, participants were predominantly um, white, non-Hispanic, and because of our field, predominantly female. Um, so the discussion in these groups focused around these two main domains. So barriers to inclusive research and then barriers to community partnerships. And then within those domains, we focused on a few specific areas um, that I'll kind of go through. In terms of barriers to research with intellectually and developmentally disabled people, um, some comments focused on kind of the IDD individual experience, uh, but most were kind of focused on study design and logistics. So essentially the ability of people with intellectual disability to complete research assessments, the validity of the data from those instruments. We then focused on inclusion and exclusion criteria. So um, what studies have and who's essentially getting left out. Um, the most significant topic um, was criteria centered around needing to speak English. So even when this wasn't formally part of the studies exclusion criteria, logistics often make it so that the study is just not equipped to adequately support non-English speaking participants. Um, and this also included recognizing that it's not just a matter of straight translating materials, but recognizing um, the differences in terms of cultural, cultural expectations. Um, and then researchers also brought up ways um, that they are aware their criteria could be impacting underserved communities um, and intellectually developmentally disabled individuals. Um, 
on this topic, about half the comments were also focused on study design and so really digging into what would need to change for studies or what parts of a protocol actually require a certain exclusion criteria. Um, so why are these in place? And for this, um, almost 90% of the comments on it were um, challenges. So this was an area that, that really presented a lot of difficulties for researchers. And the next topic was addressing the logistics of participating. So how to accommodate the needs of research participants. And so a large focus was on um, kind of funding needs. So having adequate staffing, um, having the resources to provide accommodations, and also just an overall understanding of what accommodations are needed in the first place. Um, in this area, we also addressed telehealth and both how that can bring down barriers, but also the unique barriers that telehealth um, can, can put in place as well. Um, compared to the previous topic, this was more 50-50 split. Um, so about half the comments were things that are challenging in this area, um, but there were also a lot of comments on successes that researchers have had in, in figuring out how to provide accommodations. And then the last um, area was these community partnerships. And for this, we really ended up having to kind of step back from just the partnerships and recognizing there's earlier steps and kind of the specific challenges that can present at each point. Um, so starting with reaching out, making those initial connections and even finding these con contacts within the community. And once that's done, then actually getting people engaged and invested in the research and really interested in what we do. And once those steps are in place, then we can actually get to the partnerships and establishing those long-term and ongoing relationships in the community. Um, and so within the focus groups, you're able to kind of tease apart um, the challenges that come up at each of these steps. In addition to those planned domains, I also looked at um, emergent themes and recurring topics. Um, so really the very strongest theme had to do with um, giving back this is a really strong theme and actually every single participant addressed this in some way. Um, so researchers, they really wanna feel like they are providing something useful and meaningful to families who participate in research um, rather than just you know, we're taking your data. Um, but it was also a theme throughout that this is a challenge and researchers don't always ne necessarily know the best way to go about this or even for families, what would constitute something meaningful? What is it that would actually be helpful to a family? Some additional themes that came out were um, centered around resources. So there was a lot of feedback on resources that are needed, but also how that information can be compiled and disseminated so researchers are aware of how to access these resources. Um, it's research, so funding is always going to be a problem throughout, um, but this includes things like having adequate staffing and resources, like I mentioned earlier, with things like accommodations, um, but also when trying to involve stakeholders and getting um, community input that that's often something that needs to start before even submitting a grant, which can be difficult because at that point, obviously you don't have the funding. And then studies are generally kind of short-lived. They're subject to these grant cycles um, and labs often operate very independently of one another without necessarily knowing what others are doing. And so this kind of results in outreach efforts being piecemeal um, and makes it difficult to establish these long-term community partnerships. And so having institutional support and shared resources to kind of fill in those gaps um, was something researchers felt would be really helpful here. So the groups that I did so far were with research faculty, um, but based on their responses regarding kind of staff roles and knowledge, I'm going to be adding in additional groups for other levels of research staff. So things like other project program managers um, and research coordinators. And then we'll also be going through kind of the findings from these research groups with the responses from the other groups with self-advocates, parents and family, um, and community providers. So we can kind of get that full picture of um, where the gaps are from each, each perspective. Um, with the information that we collect from these focus groups, we'll be building um, teams that will pair researchers and cultural brokers to help bridge that gap between academia and the community. And then also developing and disseminating toolkits that researchers can use to help them conduct uh, more inclusive research and improve their research programs. Yeah, so a great presentation. Um, so uh, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, the, um, one of the big initiatives at the NIH has been a focus on Down syndrome. The, the acronym that they use is INCLUDE. And it's, it's kind of now parallel with uh, a big emphasis on uh, really having more diverse representation in research. and. So they had these listening sessions and one of the things that emerged over and over again was one of the things that you pointed out was kind of the, 
the time frame of research funding does not always allow us to be out and, and kind of building those partnerships or following up and, and you know, on dissemination and continuing those partnerships. And so the, I think the, the NIH staff that were there heard that. And um, you know, I don't know if anything will come of it, but I do think that that's, um, they are aware that that is a major um, roadblock. And so I, I found it very encouraging that actually they were having these listening sessions, but also that they responded positively to that kind of overture. So, so I think uh, you and your research participants are on the right track there. That's good, good to hear. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.